Hey guys, this is Mark Metternick, and this is the question and answer session that I've been promising you. Um, I first want to thank everyone for the enormous amount of awesome questions sent in to me. And I had to pick just a handful of them because this video will end up being too long. But very excellent questions, very educational questions. I know that the people who will watch this video um, who are wanting to learn will definitely pick up on at least a handful of things that will be helpful for them. So anyway, I took the questions and um, I'm going to try my best to go as fast as possible. A few of them are personal. Most of them are more technical and business oriented about landscape photography and making a living at it and how to photograph and how to process things like that. So I'll do my best and I'm going to go as fast as I can. If this ends up going over about an hour or so, we'll end up having a part two like we did last time. So anyway, let's go. In some cases I will tell you the name, in some cases people wanted to be more anonymous. So, On this one, William McIntosh from Facebook says, in a recent conversation, I think you mentioned using a type of external air conditioner when out shooting in the desert heat for days or months at a time to help you sleep in your rig. Was that correct? If so, how did you set this up? Just trying to figure out some options for nights when the low is in the 90s. And it's really hard to sleep when it's that warm. Oh my gosh. I do know that. I've been shooting the Southwest for... Um, over 10 years I've been leading workshops out there private and group and it was only a couple of years ago that I finally decided to do that I bought a Honda generator one of the portable ones it's about $1,200 I actually had it stolen uh, this year when I was driving from Florida to the Southwest and I was in Texas and I was in an RV park somebody stole it um, off my vehicle so to buy another one, um, which was terrible. But those are really nice. You can put about a gallon of gasoline in them and they will run quietly on the side for nearly a day. Um, if I look a little tired, I am. And I just woke up just recently and I've been pushing it hard lately. So, um, So that's what I do. I have a generator. Then I just get a AC unit, you know, your standard small one that goes into windows. And I redneck it. I put it in my front uh, driver door window. I roll up the window a little bit. And then I just basically put some duct tape in the gap where there's a hole. So I don't want bugs and things like that getting in. And then I also use the reflective material that you put on your front windshield so that your dash doesn't get all cracked up. I buy a bunch of those and I basically cut them to the size of my windows and I have them all the way around on the inside. I literally the last three years, but especially the last two years before this year, um, I used to just live out there and out in the desert. I'd be out in the southwest from about July all the way till November and I'd either be photographing or I'd be leading a workshop and nothing else and I'd be photographing every single day or leading a workshop so for at least a couple of months there uh, especially June, July, August into September it's, it's too warm and so when I have that AC on literally it can be so cold in my vehicle that I'm getting into my zero bag. <laughs> I also have just to let you know um, a table that a friend of mine built. I have a Mitsubishi Montaro right now I'm gonna get a new rig but uh, it's a four-wheel drive awesome Toyo off-road tires and I lay down in the whole back. So the whole back is a bed. I've taken out the seats. So I can actually prop up against one of the seats with some pillows Put this it's like a TV tray it's a table that goes over my waist and I actually put my it's this one here it's the one that's beat up and scratched up I put that 27 inch uh, monitor right there and I run that my Mac, my MacBook Pro um, into that monitor and I run it off of that energy so one word of warning though I've had people online say that I shouldn't do that it can ruin my MacBook Pro 
um, because of the fluctuations, the inconsistency of the energy produced by the generator. I haven't had a problem, and I've done it three years in a row, but there is some kind of a device, I think, that regulates the energy going to your electronics that you can buy that I would definitely get because I wouldn't want to you know, ruin my MacBook. I just never got it and it worked really well and I could actually do critical editing in the middle of the day 107 degrees have my AC cranking be totally comfortable take naps back there all midday when it's just way too hot and kill a lot of the day so I, what I would do is I'd shoot in the evening I shoot a lot of star stuff I shoot in the morning and I'd be really tired during the day and so I do a lot of sleeping during the day and then maybe some post-processing and a lot of uh, business through my hotspot so Hopefully that helps. <clears throat> it looks very redneck. I've ac actually had police come up to me in certain places and knock on my windows like, uh, you know, are you living here or something? <laughs> but when I'm out in the desert and the remote areas, you know, there's no people out there, so it works awesome. You don't want to run your vehicle's AC, by the way, in the heat. This is a, a mechanic, uh, my mechanic told me, and that's why I switched to this system because I was running my vehicle sometimes when it get too hot and I'd run the AC and sometimes it would overheat if my fans weren't cranking enough but uh, it's very hard on vehicle engines to idle and have your AC on and just sit there and idling um, or even just idling so this system works a lot a lot better it works works great uh, you're gonna have to get a generator that's gonna cost at least $900 I got my first one barely used for $900. One of those Honda, it's a little red generator. They have the smallest one, a medium one, a bigger and bigger ones. It's the second one up from the smallest that um, runs the AC perfect, plus my computer, plus my monitor. So. Um, how do you achieve maximum sharpness without stacking, focus stacking? Where do you focus? James Luzada. Thank you James for the question. I've been shooting full time for I think I'm coming up on 14 years now and I have tried apps that tell you hyperfocal distance. I have tried a lot of different things. These days I am shooting over 80% of the time with the Canon 11 to 24 corrected lens on a full frame sensor at 11. So at 11, it's insane how much depth of field we get. I can just put it on f11 or f14 and I can get the full depth of field. <clears throat> and it doesn't really matter exactly where I focus, it's funny. So because I'm shooting so wide, I've gotten a little bit lazy at that. If I'm zooming up, I have to be really, really careful. And I, to tell you the truth, even though I'm a professional and I teach photography all year round, I write articles, I lead workshops, I private group, that's all I do. That's all I've been doing for over a decade. That is one that I have pretty much avoided. I will basically, if in doubt, use an f-stop that's a little bit uh, more stopped down, the bigger number, than um, maybe I should to make sure that I get that depth of field. If I am interested in maximum sharpness, in almost all cases, I will simply focus stack. Uh, for those who don't know what focus stacking is, it means maybe you're shooting a really wide angle, maybe you have something in the foreground that's really beautiful, but you have something way in the background, all the way to infinity, all the way to the clouds, the mountains. Um, what it is is you use your sharpest f-stop for your lens or close to it. Uh, for an f4 lens, that's f8. Generally speaking, all the Canon lenses that I've tested have been two stops away from wide open. So f4 lenses are f8, f2.8 lenses are 5.6, but I make a compromise by a stop. Um, so at 2.8, I will shoot at f8, and on my f4 lens, I'll usually shoot around f10, somewhere around there, so that the edges on the corners of the photo will be a little bit better. So then you focus on the closest possible thing, you take you know your bracketed shots if necessary and then you slightly move your focal ring toward infinity you take your shots again you move your 
focal point slightly toward infinity. I don't even look at my LCD. I just turn, click, 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 turn, click, 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 turn, click, 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 until I hit the end. Um, between my focus stacks, I will put my hand, and, that, and I'll take a picture of my hand, and that'll say, this next photo is the beginning of a focus stack. So when they come up on my computer, I know this is a focus stack. Then I can go through them and start with the first one that's sharpest for my foreground. And then I'll look through them and find that one. See, my infinity on my lenses, when I pass and I actually hit the end and it's supposed to be infinity, it goes beyond infinity and it's a little bit unsharp. So I will look at the far distant mountains and I'll try to find the one that's the sharpest. Then I'll use all those in the focus stack. And if you don't know how to focus stack, I do have a video tutorial on the subject at my website at markmetronic.com. So anyways, that's, I'm sorry that my answer, well, I'll, I'll give you one more thing. Um, a lot of times when I'm in the field, I'm leading workshops today. A lot of the time, I would say more than half the time I'm out there, I am leading somebody in a private workshop or a group. I don't set up, get on a tripod and start shooting uh, because my job is to teach and I want my clients very, very happy. So I use the ultra wide so much that a lot of times I'm just scouring around, even when the light's great, trying to help my clients find great compositions. Or maybe they're just like, hey, we know what we're doing. We don't need your help. Thank you for taking us out here and they take off. Well, then maybe I'll go shoot. But usually I'm trying to help them see different possibilities. And because the human eye-mind connection sees in panorama, for some people they're like, what? I can see my hands right now. I don't even know if you can see all the way to the left and to the right. Uh, my hands, I'm six foot and my hand span is six foot one inch. I can see my hands right now. But... I can't see my hand right now. Now I can, now I, now I can. What kind of aspect ratio is that? That by that, that's an extreme panorama. That's the way our eyes see. We don't know that because for some reason our brain translates it to being almost spherical, the way we think that we're seeing. Um, but ultra wides, they do not see reality anything like our eyes see it. So absolutely so often people can be standing in the middle of the coolest composition ever and they don't even know it I can't even tell you how many times I mean good good shooters too I'll take them out and maybe there'll be just a little bit of cracked you know mud playa in the southwest or whatever and because they don't think it goes on forever they don't think there's even remotely a possibility of a shot or they'll have their camera on their tripod and they're just moving it around I always get them to take the camera off the tripod and what I do is I show them. I like move it around. I was like, well, what, what do you guys think of this? Click, and then I'll show them my LCD and they'll be like, whoa, I would have never thought that was there. And so I'm a huge believer in scouring, scouring, scouring positions and with the ultra wide angle and trying to find something really unique that doesn't look like the way our eyes would interpret it. And when I'm doing this, I'm usually doing this for clients, like I said, and I'm in a hurry. So what I'll do is instead of using F8 or whatever, I'll just crank it to like F14 or F16. I will usually just focus in the scene by about maybe, you know, 10, 15 feet, like a third or a fourth, a little ways into the scene. I'll shoot off my shots and I'll leave. And believe it or not, with the 11, um, those shots almost always are sharp from end to end. So, let me get to the next question. <clears throat> hey Mark, kudos on that amazing compliment by Mark Adamus about your work. Since you have mentioned him quite a few times over the years, I know that you mention him in your workshops, your educational materials, and you have in social media. Uh, including podcasts about how he has inspired you as a photographer. I'm curious how that felt. I'm not sure exactly which one you're talking about because he's complimented me uh, a few times recently that have been notable. Uh, there was on 500 PX. He he piped in on one of my shots recently and told me it was awesome and basically I owned the area. It was uh, uh, an area in the southwest that a lot of people want to go to. And um, 
He was very, very complimentary. I've actually met him in person. We're both from Oregon. We lived one town away from each other, like about 20 minutes away, but we never met. And we both came into photography seriously about uh, almost the same time. He started about three years before me. He's a lot younger than me. But uh, um, we talked on the phone many, 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 many times over the years. I, you're not asking me about that, but he has always been a great inspiration to me um, for many years there. I believe him to be the forerunner landscape photographer in the world, really pushing post-processing, pushing um, locations, pushing um, the camera, the dynamics of the camera, dynamic range of the camera, uh, you know, uh, dynamicness of photos, waters crashing at you, sun star, crazy clouds, movement. So um, he's been a huge inspiration to me. Um, I finally met him in Patagonia uh, a couple years ago and it was just funny. Um, I was in Patagonia and I was with a great friend and he says, oh, you know, Mark Adamus is, is in that hotel right there. And it was just the next building over. I was like, oh, really? Well, it's about time to meet him. So I walked in there and we, we, we uh, met. And then we went to Chile and I was leading a group workshop there. And so was he at the same time. And we were shooting and basically almost in the exact same spots. So um, at dinner time, I would go upstairs to try to kind of get away from everybody to get a little bit of business done, catch up on emails and stuff stuff and and uh, he'd be doing the same thing so we sat down next to each other and had several conversations and um, I found him to be very nice um, very complimentary very generous very generous he showed me his photos on his camera he told me locations to go to he he just went out of his way and um, also um, people who do these workshops more than not workshop hop so they go to all these kind of big main names and i would say that probably at least a quarter to a third of the people that do my workshops have done a mark adamus workshop and i love it when it uh they have because they they know how um things are done they're they're ready i mean they're ready they're ready to drive miles they're ready to sleep in their vehicle if necessary they're, they're ready to do whatever it takes to get the photo. Whereas the people who've never done it before, they, you know, some of them are intimidated by, you know, hey, we're gonna be chasing the light and we don't know exactly where we're gonna stay until kind of the last moment sometimes and things like that, so. But I have heard um, from quite a few people that have taken his workshops that he's actually brought me up and mentioned me in very complimentary ways. Um, so, about how I do workshops and things like that. So anyway, we all need to have a handful of people at least that greatly inspire what we do. That doesn't mean we're trying to be a carbon copy of who they are, but it does mean that they're doing something that's inspiring us. What inspired me so much about him was he was pioneering to the extreme and he was you know, doing radical things to get photos. Some people questioned that over the years, but he's the real deal. He would, you know, hike the entire uh, Crater Lake Rim, you know, over such and such days in the snow and sleep in his tent during storms, or he'd go into the Yukon into places that people don't go to, to find this new mountain range to try to get the, the lakes before they froze with the aurora borealis and things like that. I was like, that stuff was just like awesome to me. Um, I was afraid when I very first started, I was afraid to pull an overnighter by myself. I was afraid to hike in the dark by myself. So I would see him maybe going out for weeks at a time in bear territory, solo tenting, and I'd be like, well, surely I can do more. <laughs> so long answer but hopefully it's educational in the sense that we all need those people to inspire us and I would communicate with them. I remember one time I sent him a text and I was in Glacier National Park and I was gonna like challenge myself to backcountry camp where there's bears all over the place. I've had 
plenty of bear encounters there. And I asked him, I said, don't you even get nervous? You know, I, I, I was just texting him and I didn't know where he was. He texted me back, you know, about the bears, about, about backcountry camping by yourself in bear territory. And he he texted me back. It was clear enough. It's like, Mark, comma, I am right now boarding a solo plane to go to such and such territory in Alaska, and it's where all the bears are, to solo camp for three weeks or something like that. <laughs> So, uh, I was like, okay, well, I surely can pull an overnighter or two. So, anyway, um, it felt awesome. It's encouraging. Um, there's not just one photographer today that I, you know, aspire this, in, you know, am inspired by. Um, there's a lot of great photographers today, but he has definitely been among the very top, if not the top over the years in inspiring my work. Thank you for asking the question. Um, here's Chris B from Facebook, I think. Mark, with your new video tutorial, complete workflow from A to Z pre-released. Yes, it's still pre-release as I'm filming this. It's not officially released yet, but it's for sale. Um, you take people through the, your, your entire workflow. Isn't it counterproductive to give all your secrets away in one video because it seems to me that maybe people can learn everything and then not need any more instruction? I'm just asking from a business perspective. It's a fair enough question. It's a really good question. Um, and I have a very simple answer to that. Every photo that I work on brings out different techniques and different needs need to be addressed. So one photo will not bring out every single need and every single issue that needs to be addressed. So I believe I will be able to produce 10, 15 videos on different kinds of images that will bring out different workflows that work the very best for those images. And I also do believe that by going from raw, um, even, you know, before your custom presets into custom presets all the way through to either a finished web version or a print, uh, people can learn an enormous amount. I have seen other people's workflows, my favorite photographers, I've seen a lot of their workflows. And even if I might use some different types of techniques, in fact, they all kind of use different techniques from each other, but are going for a similar type of thing, you know, punchy, poppy, uh, dramatic, um, wonderful light, um, little surreal images. Um, there's so much you can learn from an artist. And you get these people sometimes that are real linear, A, B, C, D. I just want to know, you know, an exact amount that you do here or there. That's not the best way to learn. Uh, the best way to learn is to learn all of the tools and techniques, then figure out intuitively how to use them to create the vision that you're trying to create for your particular image. So um, the reason I brought that up is because I have been able to see um, Adamus's workflow and some other people that are big, big names. And one of the things that's my favorite thing about being able to watch that is not as much, hey, here's the levels tool or here's how I sharpen or whatever. For me, a lot of it is just how does the artist think? You know, what's their approach to an image? What are they trying to accomplish? What are they thinking when they are beginning to work on an image all the way through to completion? I was really amazed by a handful of artists that are big names today about their thinking process, their philosophy, what they're thinking, what they're trying to accomplish. And then, yeah, some of the techniques are phenomenal. I mean, they're life-changing. And we all have different ones, but um, again, every photo brings out different needs. And so no, no way, shape or form are you going to learn everything 
there is to know or everything that I do or anybody else does by watching them work on one single photo. Uh, every photo presents different, completely different needs and thus different techniques. Okay, next question is by, just says Steve. This is Facebook. I saw your advertisement about your two-day Mastering Fine Art Printing Workshop with Master Printer and Guru Robert Park in Las Vegas on January 13th to 14th, 2018. I absolutely want to attend, but the dates will not work for me in January. Two questions. Will you and Robert be doing another Mastering Fine Art Printing Workshop in 2018? The other question is, I am thinking about buying your full 11 video tutorial bundle on your website for now since it is 40% off. What video or videos of your 11 would you uh, would best address what you and Robert will be teaching? I'll watch those and then hopefully be able to attend your next workshop on printing if you have one. So first question, will you and Robert be doing another one? Um, we announced this about a week ago. It's half full. We're expected to fill it up. If we feel like there's the demand, then of course, uh, this is the funnest thing to teach. I love it when I can save people a ton of money, a ton of time, and help them master completely to perfection the printing processes for any type of print. Inkjet, canvas, metal, high gloss, whatever that they do. So it's it's absolutely my favorite thing to teach. I could teach it all day long and and be, have a smile from ear to ear. Um, Robert is guru of gurus and um, I know that he feels the same way. And so it's an incredible privilege to be doing this with him. I consider him among the very top printmakers in the whole world. I don't think anybody can beat them. Uh, but I do believe there are a handful of printers out there that I'm aware of, and I've seen, uh, met some of them, um, that you know have absolutely mastered to the minutia detail every single step in workflow and in the printing processes to produce prints that can't be any better. And he is absolutely one of them. He owns a lab. He's, you know, he's innovated the most incredible proprietary high gloss photo paper in the world. Beats metal, beats Fuji Flex, beats Fuji Pearl, beats inkjet, beats everything. Um, so anyway, uh, we both are printing nerds and obsessed with printing processes. So this is just going to be a pure joy and if the demand is there then we certainly will do it again so that's answer one answer two uh, which videos I have 11 now and I have about 11 in my head that are still in the making and I'm I've got revisions going on too so um two of them the ultimate sharpening workflow for fine art printing that takes you through everything from raw capture sharpening to the absolute best algorithms for upsizing and people are people will be surprised that think that they know what are the best algorithms for upsizing many times the testing is faulty and then we get the information that like genuine fractals used to be purported as the best upsizing algorithm it has a different name now um, but what a lot of people didn't know is there is like a sort of edge detection sharpening built into it. There was an a, Adobe Guru guy, big name, who used to say, oh, I like Bicubic Sharper. It produces better, more sharper prints. Well, I talked to the engineers, uh, then I studied what they told me and I found out is correct. Yes, if you size these up before you actually do your output sharpening, like you size up your print really big, um, it does appear to be better, but it's not. It has sharpening built into the upsize. And there is a new algorithm that I was unaware of 
that almost no one uses that is absolutely the best algorithm for high frequency, very fine detail um, to middle frequency areas, but it's not the best for smooth surfaces or clouds or smooth things. So that video tutorial will go through all of that, viewing distances, PPI, which ones to choose, uh, different PPIs, you need to view at different viewing distances. Um, grain simulation, not to create a creative grain look, but to create the perfect illusion of more quality detail. So all of that is in that video tutorial. There is uh, one or two revisions I'm gonna be doing in the next few days. Um, about like the 5k monitors mm -mm. Um, they are making it harder and they, they are widening the gap of what we actually see and how the print how the prints are produced sorry for those who just went out and got their newest you know I, I went and bought the brand new iMac the very best one you could possibly buy and I sent it back um, but anyway, so all of that's going to be covered in that video. Then the next one is uh, Mastering Fine Art Printmaking and Color Management. And that goes into the whole color management side of how to master an image for print. I believe if you watch those two, plus Ultimate Lightroom Raw, um, that is a seven, like a seven and a half hour course in the raw converter and how to optimize your images in the raw converter before you go into Photoshop. Plus it has Photoshop techniques too. I believe if you really work on those three videos uh, among the other ones, the other ones are awesome too. There's a lot of things in there. Um, but those are the three that I would recommend the very, very most. And there is, if you go to YouTube and punch in Mark Metternich, M-E-T-T-E-R-N-I-C-H, N as in Nancy, I-C-H, um, and then you look at Ultimate Lightroom Raw, and it's called Segment. Ultimate Lightroom Raw Segment. There is a 47 minute segment of my video tutorial, Ultimate Lightroom Raw, and you'll be able to tell uh, from that video how in depth and how into the minutia I get when it comes to, um, this is about capture sharpening, raw sharpening, deconvolution sharpening, how to use and not use the detail tab in raw. People send me prints all the time, big names. They, I'm kind of like the print guy. And um, under confidentiality agreements, a lot of times they, they don't want people to know this, but they'll send them to me and they'll say, hey man, you know, would you at least take the, a look at this and see if this will print at 40 inches or whatever. And then um, a lot of times I'm sending it back saying, sorry, no way. And then they want me to fix it or they want me to uh, you know, match it for print or whatever. But one of the biggest culprits is a lack of understanding of what the detail tab was actually intended to do in Lightroom or Camera Raw. And it goes for a lot of other raw converters as well. So, um, or do a Skype session with me. If you want to know everything there is to know that I know, um, from raw capture to a absolute master print, we can crank that out in probably two hours, maybe three two and a half hours and you will have that on a video and you can go through it as many times as you want. I do that occasionally with people when they want to do it that way and instead of going all the way to Las Vegas. But the thing in Las Vegas is going to be awesome. It's going to be two day intensive. Um, it, we're going to be nerding out on prints like you've never seen before. Um, it's going to be a blast. Uh, the people that I know that are going already, uh, the half, it's a limit of 20 people. We have 10 already. Uh, wonderful people. Um, some of them are excellent printmakers. Um, but we're also going to have a lot of hands-on stuff and we're even going to take somebody's raw file and we're going to take it from raw all the way to print. And I think people are going to get discounts and be able to make their own prints or something like that too. So anyway. Um, Leanne Patterson from Facebook says, using full frame format, I think the biggest stumbling block for me is cropping and sizing in post-processing and exporting. I have a hard time figuring out how to export a certain size print in Lightroom or Photoshop, mostly Lightroom, and knowing how to export for print versus web. I mean, I can make a whole video on that. So, 
That's a hard one to answer. If you are a high volume wedding event photographer or something, then exporting through Lightroom using some generic sharpening or whatever and sizing or creating um, an action and applying that action to images in Photoshop to export um, or other ways is, is maybe a good idea. I mean, it is a good idea. It's a great idea. You want to save time. I'm a fine art print, uh, fine art photographer and printmaker, but fine art photographer. And so for me, it's not about volume, it's about quality. And there are ways to do that. And I would say you absolutely have to go into Photoshop. For the size up, there's no other better place, and that is a science, as I'm kind of hitting on a little bit here already. It's a science. If you want to do a, like a one-hour Skype lesson with me, I can go into it uh, for you and and talk to you about you know how the best way to do that might be for you. Um, you don't. You can know the ultimate, but you don't have to always do the ultimate. You can do things. Uh, easier but by knowing the ultimate you know kind of like what you're sacrificing and and you know how far do you want to scale down to make it a little bit easier but still get great results um, when it comes to web it needs to be done in Photoshop as well and there are some awesome web techniques that a lot of people don't know um, I have ultimate web sharpening part one part two um, that is a video tutorial that hits on all of that and I have Mastering Fine Art Printmaking, or I mean, uh, um, the Ultimate Sharpening Workflow for Fine Art Printing that goes into the upsize. Um, and viewing distances and what resolution to print at and all that. I love teaching that stuff. I am a absolute nerd geek about that. So uh, Leanne, if you watch this video, uh, feel free to look me up. Mark Metternick, M-E-T-T-E-R-N-I-C-H at gmail.com and we could talk about maybe doing a Skype session. I'm 75 an hour, I'm not out of reach. Um, when I don't want to teach, I will put that up to like 99 an hour or more. And, uh, but right now I am more of a family man and I'm wanting to teach more than I am wanting to travel like the last many years where I was traveling like 300 days a year or more. So I'm available. Hopefully that helps, but uh, what, to, to answer again, upsizing is very comprehensive. Downsizing can be a little bit comprehensive. Cropping, I do most of my cropping in RAW. I try to get that done in RAW and not do it in Photoshop. Once in a while I crop a little bit in Photoshop, but in most cases I try to get it done in RAW. So if you want more details, that's all I can tell you for now. Next question, how long does it typically take for you to process a photo? And how does that compare to many of your professional peers in landscape photography? Uh, MN. I think that was an email. I've had the great privilege of being able to see the workflow of most of my favorite landscape photographers. Although all of our workflows are always evolving and changing and whatever. The biggest thing that that's benefited me isn't necessarily the techniques, it's more the idea behind what they're trying to accomplish and how they think about photos. Now it wasn't a question but I wanted to throw that in there. Some of my peers, I don't know how long every one of them takes to process a photo, and I'm sure, just like me, it depends on the photo. Some I can crank out quick, some of them can take a long time. Depends on what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, are you doing a focus stack panorama with a wide dynamic range, which takes blending? Or is it just a single shot, you got the whole dynamic range there? Um, is for the most part the image looking crazy good just right off the bat with custom default settings or are you having to really work it a lot to get it to look the way that you saw it or the way you want it to be? Um, in my 
newest video tutorial that's pre-released. I haven't officially sent it out to my newsletter yet, but by this time this video comes out, it will be out, I'm sure. Um, complete workflow from A to Z on a particular image. It takes me 5.5 hours to finish that image, but I did more tweaking to it afterward. Just little bits of things. I would say if I had to nail it down, I spend about maybe a full day on an image, but never all at once. I will work on a photo for a little while while I'm inspired. I will drop it. I will come back to it another day, another week, another month, sometimes even a year later. I have a folder, and many of us, uh, many of my peers do this too, um, the best images or my best images or, or, or images to work on. And I will just sort of go around and whatever ones inspire me on a particular day, I will push it forward, push it forward. Um, but if I have to finish an image and it's the one that I'm working on, generally about eight hours, I'd say. And I'd say I do the heavy lifting. If I'm really serious, I'll do the heavy lifting in about two or three hours. Most of that's in RAW and then also maybe blending into Photoshop. Um, double, triple, quadruple or more processing the image, bringing it into Photoshop. And then it's just knocking down the worst offender over and over and over again until there really is nothing left. That you can't even see one single thing left in that image that bugs you. Or you think somebody else is going to point out and say, oh, I don't like that rock intruding into that edge corner or whatever. So um, the fine tuning is done in Photoshop. About 30% more quality can be had out of my images or anybody's images today if they have Photoshop skills. If you're trying to get it all done in Lightroom, you're really throwing um, a lot of quality onto the cutting room floor. So, but it gets to more fine tuning, more minute, more fine tuning, more minute until finally you reach nothing left. Big heavy lifting and then medium and then smaller and then down to um, where there's just nothing. Sorry, there's a bug. Um, there's just nothing else to do to the image. So I say probably about eight hours. I do know of some of my cont uh, peers that have been putting in 40 hours on an image, 50 hours on an image. I have a client that's a big name. He came to me to help him with prints because he doesn't have that specialty, but he's an awesome, 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 awesome photographer. And he actually spends 40 to 50 hours on his images, on one image. But guess what? He sells them for big bucks. So it just depends, you know, it just depends. And it depends on the image. If you have a foggy image of the ocean and it's just almost all fogged out and a bird flying by, I mean, how much time are you gonna have to put into that? But if you have like a focus stack, a wide dynamic range, your sky's not looking right in the frame, your land's not looking right, you have to make separate adjustments to both of those, you got to put that all together, then you're dealing with a more complicated photo. So I hope that helps. Kyle Peterson. Hey Kyle. Hi Mark, in previous years you have traveled as much or over 300 days a year photographing or leading photography workshops as per your bio. This obviously did not leave you much time to teach people photography or post-processing via your Skype on-screen lessons. I have wanted some private instruction in much needed post-processing improvement and wanted to know if you are now making room for that in your schedule. Uh, short answer, yep, I am. Year after year after year, for the last 14 years, I was trying to shoot more, shoot more, shoot more. I ended up going through a divorce, which wasn't related to my business, but that, as tough as it was, it afforded me freedom that I had never had before. So I, instead of getting utterly depressed, or while I was utterly depressed, I decided to get rid of everything scale down, get rid of rent, and live out of my vehicle for almost three years. And I pushed those numbers up over 300 days a year, either photographing or doing workshops. And then I would post using my hotspot. And I'd do my post-processing in hotels, or I would do them in my vehicle 
like I previous previously talked about. Um, so I didn't have much time. I would do some Skype lessons here and there, like out of the hotel, off of their Wi-Fi. Now I have met a woman and I'm living in Florida and we're actually moving out of this place to a new house starting today. I'm gonna have a different office. Um, but I don't want to be gone for months at a time anymore. I just wanna be gone for maybe a week or two or max three. So yes, my business plan is shifting and I am making much, much, much more time for um, teaching online Skype lessons. If those people, you know, if some people don't know what that means, that means you, you get a free version of Skype. We see each other, we can hear each other. I can hit share screen so you see my screen. We can work on your files or my files and we can go straight into um, a prioritized approach to what the student is needing to learn the very most. And I love teaching, I love teaching. It really does a wonder of keeping your chops up. It makes you think about what you're doing and slow down and think about it much more because you're teaching it. And I just love to teach. I have always loved teaching and people have always told me I should be a teacher since I was late teens, early 20s. And I am a teacher today. I make video tutorials. I freelance write. I um, you know, teach one-on-one -on -one via Skype. I teach groups. So, uh, it's, it's my joy. I love it.